I want to thank everyone for coming. This is the fourth annual uh, New Now Next International Media Conference uh, by the Asian American Journalists Association and the JMSC. Of course, you know where that is. That's right here. My name is Ramey Innocencio. I am the uh, Asia president of the AAJA chapter. So I just want to say thanks. We're really, really super excited uh, for this conference. Uh, right now, I believe AJ, who is in charge of logistics here, he just told me that uh, we're on track to uh, uh, have a record number of people. Uh, so I just want to congratulate uh, everyone who is involved in this. Um, let's see. Uh, I just want to recognize some AAJers who came from afar. If you are from the cities, just call out. I just want to know where you guys are. Uh, I know we have a contingent from Tokyo. Where are you guys? You can you you can you can you can say whoo. It's okay too. All right. <laughs> uh, AAJers from Seoul. There we are, yeah. <laughs> uh, and from Singapore, I know you're out there. All right, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, Bangkok, Bangkok. A couple from Bangkok. Uh, and then from Hanoi. I know we got one out there. <laughs> uh, and from Manila, I know we have a few here. There we are. <laughs> and Taipei. Ah, there we are. And Beijing or uh, mainland China? I know we have 17 students from Shantou University. There you all are. Thanks. And that last but not least from here in Hong Kong. There you are. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so I want to introduce our national president, uh, Paul Chung, to say a few words. He flew in from New York, where he's head of uh, interactives at the Associated Press, uh, just to say just a few words um, about what AAJ is, if you guys don't know. And he, he's streaming it out of his Google Glass. I just took all of your credit card information, but not to be worried, it's all going to AAJA. Um, so believe it or not, AAJA has been around for more than 30 years. It was founded in Los Angeles when we realized that there isn't enough Asian American in the newsrooms. Now, being an Asia chapter, why does that matter? As the world has gotten smaller, diversity increasingly becomes more important. Not only do we need to know how to tell the stories of people in the U.S., but how do we telegraph the story of Asia to the world? And when you think about the Western media, from CNN to AP to Reuters to the Wall Street Journal, it's equally important for them to be able to tell the story of Asia with fairly, accurately, and with that balance. And hence, AHA's mission spread to Asia in a way that is different than our mission in the U.S. So I'm really proud of what we have done in the Asia chapter, from a chapter of 10 to 20 people when we first started to a chapter of over 100 people right now. It's actually 180. So it's actually the second or the third largest chapter of AHA behind New York and Los Angeles. And as I mentioned last night, Asia chapter is the chapter that brings the Asian in AAJA, and I'm really proud of the work that the leadership team has done you know, in Asia. So if you haven't joined AAJA yet, you should do it now. Why? Because of conferences like this, it really put you in connection with great people like the panelists that you're gonna see today, you know, Ted Anthony from AP, Paul Beckett from Wall Street Journal, Alan Soon from, from um, Yahoo, Dave from Reuters, I mean Bloomberg. We didn't talk about those companies. <laughs> Um, so this is, you know, really good chance for you to connect with the top of the top in Asia. And we wouldn't be able to do it without an organization like AAJA. So again, you know, great job for this kickoff and kudos to the Asia chapter um, leadership team for putting together one of the biggest conference in Asia. Thank you. Uh, in addition, I'd like to uh, give it up. Give it up. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Uh, in addition, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, we have all of them listed on this board right here, everything from, from Google. A shout out to Joyce Howe, who will be talking about Google for Pros later on. Uh, Cathay Pacific, who's sponsoring a, uh, two round trip tickets to anywhere in Asia. This is the fourth time that Cathay Pacific is doing this in the four years that we've been doing N3. Uh, Bloomberg, of course. Uh, Grand Hyatt, uh, giving us two nights hotel at the Tokyo uh, Hotel. Uh, Oppo, Xiaomi, and uh, OnePlus or actually Oppo and Xiaomi are giving us uh, 10 Android smartphones that we're gonna be raffling away. Uh, more on that later. Key Club, of course, for those of you who went last night. Uh, Connects, I think all of you got a charger. If not, uh, check in with registration for that. Uh, Jolly Bee is gonna be sponsoring our lunch. I know a lot of you like fried chicken, like myself. Um, 
uh, the Associated Press is sponsoring notebooks. Uh, Lux City Guides also with our raffle. Uh, Medium Asia, who helped put us in touch with Key last night, as well as many anonymous AJ sponsors who gave, honestly, a lot of money, but they just wish to be anonymous. So thank you to everyone there. Um, also, I want to recognize our JMSC volunteers before we start, because without them, they've been our liaison. So I, anyone in a black shirt uh, with the JMSC logo, like Kevin Corot here, uh, please say thank you to them, because without them, AJ wouldn't be able to do this kind of stuff. And they're all student volunteers, so they will be looking for jobs later, so please be nice to them. Uh, finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Ying Chan uh, to say just a few words. Uh, she's dean and founder of the JMSC, and then after that, she's going to take over for our first all-star panel. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Ying Chan. I'm a professor of journalism and also director of the uh, JMSC at the University of Hong Kong. Um, the GMSC is known as called Center, but in fact it is a full-fledged academic department. We offer undergraduate degrees, professional graduate degrees, and uh, MPhil and PhD degrees. And it would have been around for 15 years. And when I came back from Hong Kong, uh, from the U.S., to create a program, and I'm still stuck here now. Um, and uh, I'm very uh, honored uh, to partner with uh, AAJA because my heart is really with AAJA. I was in New York. I was in that loft on the east side uh, at the preparatory meeting of the Asian AAJA New York chapter. And that was uh, probably two decades ago. You know. And uh, so I'm glad to see many friends from the U.S. Um, at last night uh, at the uh, key reception, uh, we have many alums uh, also working in this industry now, and uh, many of them were uh, at the reception. So for our visitors from uh, outside uh, Asia, uh, the news is that there are jobs in Hong Kong, in Asia, uh, various kinds. If you're ambitious, you're ent entrepreneurial, right? And we'll soon find out also uh, from our chiefs. Uh, we have an excellent panel of chiefs um, of major media organizations. So welcome, everybody. Enjoy the um, two days of conference. And the conference is being streamed live right, uh, by our team of students at the back. Uh, everything is on record. And uh, Raymond will an announce we have the hashtag on, on Twitter. So, uh, do I encourage you to treat and block and uh, put us on Facebook. So, thank you. All right, great. And the hashtag for that is uh, N3Con. All right. Uh, so with that, actually, you don't go anywhere because you're just going to stay back here. Uh, all right. So I'd like to call up our, our first panel of uh, Asia Pacific news leaders just to uh, take the stage. And Ying, I'm just going to give this back to you, and uh, we'll have at it. Okay. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome. I call this panel, Hail to the Chiefs. So everyone on the panel here uh, are chiefs, um, running major uh, bureaus uh, in the, actually the chiefs in, in Asia. And um, we have uh, uh, Paul Beckett, running, a Wall Street Journal Asia editor, Ted Anthony, Ted. AP Asia Pacific News Editor, David Merritt, Bloomberg Asia Pacific Executive Director, Mark Levine, AFP's Asia Pacific Editor-in-Chief, also Alan Soon, who's um, also from uh, Singapore, he's based in Singapore, Yahoo Southeast Asia's Managing Editor. So what I'm going to do is that we'll go, I'm going to throw a few rounds of uh, questions, and we'll have the chiefs answer them. And um, I would not dare to venture, actually, to introduce them because I don't want to make mistakes, you know, because they, they're such a long, distinguished journalism uh, uh, history. So um, they will introduce themselves very briefly, um, and then we'll open up uh, to the floor. So get your questions uh, ready. And you, you really, I, I, I don't think you ever have this chance of five chiefs in the same room on the panel answering your questions. So get your questions ready. Um, so um, 
Uh, I, I uh, would, this panel would uh, discuss around like actual three key areas, product, audience, um, and organization management. And, and then finally, we'll get to the question of training the talents that's needed. Right? So I'll start with the issue of uh, a product. And I'll just throw it at Paul. You know, you had a recent speech, which is quite recent in April. When you talk about that, um, the revolution that's happening in the newsroom, so what does that mean in terms of the product that the Wall Street Journal is producing? Great. Uh, thanks very much. Morning, everybody. Um, I'll just speak for myself. I'm still about two cups of coffee away from um, being particularly lively, so please bear with us while we get up to speed. Um, it's lovely to see everybody. Um, it's great to be on this panel. The what is changing, you'll read, you probably do read an awful lot that's really depressing about journalism at the moment in terms of jobs, in terms of all the things that are changing, and it always seems to be in some way or another for the worst, uh, for the worst, and, and people of our generation all too quickly um, look to a golden age which, um, you know, of a, of a decade ago or of two decades ago, uh, and I think it's all nonsense, to be honest. The, it's an extraordinary time to be in journalism, an extraordinary time to be in Asia in journalism. And everybody in this room is going to play a part in changing, in defining journalism of the future. And none of us 10 years ago could say that we were part of that revolution. Right? And everybody's going to, because no one's really figured out, no one's really figured out where it's all going. So you have an incredible opportunity by being in journalism in Asia at this particular moment to help define that and where I bet every news, everybody up here is going to tell you that there's momentum for Asia coverage, there's momentum for expanding in Asia, there's momentum and interest in finding more readers in Asia, so it is a fantastic time to be doing it. Um, what I was talking to um, about a few weeks back was really how much things have changed uh, just for us at the journal um, you know, we used to used to have the luxury of just sitting at your desk, um, sending in a story from your computer, and then after that, you didn't really care where it. Well, you didn't know where it went, didn't particularly care where it went because the next day it just appeared on people's doorsteps in the newspaper, uh, miraculously. And then you assumed that everybody who either picked up everybody who picked up the newspaper was obviously going to read your story, even though it was on B17, and you're like, oh, that's great, I've got 1.7 million readers. The things that have changed for us the most is we have a multiple audiences now and only one of them and only one of our platforms is the print newspaper in the United States. And about 98% of my day is spent on reaching new audiences in Asia and doing both from a coverage perspective and from thinking about who we're trying to target and who we're trying to reach and how we're trying to reach them. So from a coverage perspective, we're all very good at doing big, broad, global stories but are we doing stories that are relevant to the audience that's around us here in Hong Kong? More broadly in Asia, there's about four or five layers of audience before you get to what would be considered a classic Wall Street Journal global audience. And we need to cater to all those audiences because they're important to us and they will be important to our future. And then in terms of the reporters and the journalists and what they're doing, reporters and editors, they have to think about reaching those people. So there used to be a very homogenous type of Wall Street Journal story, and now that itself has uh, is very dramatically, and the way that we count on our staff to reach them has very dramatically. So everybody really, once you hit the button on your computer and send in your story, it's the beginning of a process and it's not the end. And that process has to involve you being a aggressive outreach to basically become the distributors of our journalism, the promoters of our journalism, uh, in not creepy ways, and the and and the engagement of the readers that we want to reach and quite often uh, that really the front lines of all of this is everybody sitting in this room you all do far more of it than I do but I realize the importance of it is absolutely vital and you'll see a lot more of that going ahead um, thank you next maybe we'll go to Bloomberg yes here um, how is it uh, the revolution? Is there a revolution going on at Bloomberg too? How, what kind of news products you are producing? 
Sure. I mean, I, you know, I would agree with everything that, that Paul said. It, it, it resonates with the experiences we're having at Bloomberg News as well. And um, I, you know, the, the growth story is the same as well. And, and Asia is really the biggest expanding area for us in terms of, um, in terms of headcount and in terms of uh, the interest in the stories and the new audiences. And what we're trying to do is to reach the audience across the whole spectrum of the sort of news that you're delivering. So whether it's the, the one line headline, which is from the breaking news story, all the way through to perhaps a 2,000 word feature that runs in a, one of our print magazines and everything in between. And so what we're after is the sort of journalist who can be adaptable and flexible and change gears in between all those different modes. And as Paul said as well, promoting and being the advocate for their journalism, so whether it's on Twitter, social media, perhaps uh, speaking on radio, doing a hit on television, thinking about how their story is going to play out, both on you know, the Bloomberg Terminal, which is our core audience, on the web, uh, on mobile, on radio, um, on TV, and in one of our print magazines as well. So it's incredibly complex now uh, to think about all these different audiences that you have to cater to. And so we're looking for those journalists who can shift between those modes effectively um, and uh, really serve all those different sorts of readers, or perhaps the same reader, but in different modes throughout the day, because they'll want to consume news in multiple different ways through different devices, depending on what they're doing, whether they're waking up in the morning, whether they're at their desk, or on their way home from work in the evening. That is very different from the situation 10, 15 years ago. So delivering stories on multi-platforms. Absolutely. Right? So maybe we'll hear from Mark of AFP, um, a European perspective, or does it make any difference? In, in many ways, it doesn't, it doesn't really make a difference. I think the, uh, the uh, importance now is, is audiences, reaching audiences uh, wherever they may be in the world, uh, whether, they're, whether they're international, regional, or or local. Um, I mean, AFP as an international news agency have always catered to readers in multiple markets all over the world. We've never really um, had, uh, in our English services particularly, a home market. So in many ways, we're, you, we're prepared for the challenge of, uh, of fragmented audience sectors, um, geographically anyway. But even then, uh, what's, what's, what's happening now is that uh, uh, they're, they're further fragmenting and um, we are having to change our uh, business model, the way we work, the way we write, and the way we report to, uh, to, to cater to the challenge of uh, real-time news. It's, uh, it's, we've always been, um, we've always reported real-time news, but not, not in the same, same way that uh, we do now. Now it's, it's about live, whether it's live, uh, live news reports, live blogs, live photography, live television and live graphics. And that's, you look uh, for a major breaking story like, um, you know, the disappearance of the Malaysian airliner MH370. MH this is where it really comes into the fore. You've got a, a, major, a major story which is spread across up to 10 different, different countries um, of interest to pretty much everybody in the world because it's uh, something apart from anything else that any human can relate to is the horror of an aircraft dis disappearing, and being able to cover that, uh, um, those mul multiple strands and multiple ang angles in, in, in real time, uh, visually, um, and our coverage is increasingly visually driven. So this is this is forced a complete rethink of the way we actually approach the news. Our newsrooms, walls are coming down in our newsrooms physically, they're also coming down so like psychologically, and the architecture of, of uh, of news is changing very, very rapidly. It used to be that major news organizations had silos. You had text reporters, you had first photographers, you had, you know, videographers, um, and they were all headed by different chiefs and coverage. You know, if you were lucky, it might coincide on a on a on a on a good day. Um, now, from the from the very outset of a story, uh, we have to think in in terms of of multimedia coverage, how best to cover that story across a range of media. It doesn't mean that every story uh, necessarily would be covered you know, in every single medium. It means choosing the, the medium that best suits coverage for that story. So I mean, in our organization, and I think in uh, many, many others uh, from my, my colleagues sitting, sitting here, we've, um, we've changed the way we do things. I sit across a newsroom, um, an entire newsroom of uh, journalists from all media disciplines and uh, we when we have our daily meetings we think across all of those all the all the all of those disciplines 
from the start of a story. It requires planning um, across all those disciplines from the beginning. I mean, as soon as you know you have a big a big breaking story, you think about deploying um, uh, journalists from uh, the the most crucial disciplines that need to cover that story. You know, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines in, in November, more than 6,000 people killed. It was nobody expected it to to be of that magnitude, but. Uh, uh, from the beginning, the, 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 the thinking has to be now um, that you deploy, uh, first of all, visual, visual journalists on, on, on the ground. Um, images are really driving stories, particularly on, on, on digital, digital platforms. I mean, any um, iPad app uh, it really puts photo, photo and video f first and foremost. So what we're trying to do is break down those barriers and encourage journalists and photographers to shoot video and um, that has a obviously that has an impact right across our hiring I mean there is absolutely um, as, as, as Paul said you know the future of journalism is bright but it's going to take a lot more skills specialities yes but you know being polyvalent being multi being able to, to, to multitask across and be able to think in a number of media across the board Um, AP, um, you are the one of the biggest or the biggest wire surfers, or do you still call yourself a wire surfers, right? So let's hear from you about uh, if there's revolution going on in the newsroom. I think there's revolution that we're responding to in the world in this respect, and I think that there's revolution that we're, um, we're trying to drive. Uh, like AFP, uh, we, we've always had multiple audiences, and, uh, and we know that, and we've, uh, we've thought about that for many years. But I think that there's been an increasing realization in our organization over the past few years that not only do we need to understand our multiple audiences, but we really need our journalists to understand the products that go to those multiple audiences and the things that, that their journalism populates. This is something that uh, has not been a core competency of journalists in the AP, uh, and it is growing. We are emphasizing it. Um, we have instituted a program of, uh, of story ownership across the AP that involves not only when a, a major story happens, not only is a person in charge of the journalism, but they're also in charge of being across the output and the products and seeing how this looks to the outside. And that has uh, resulted in some revelations because when you work from the inside out in a newsroom, you see a very different uh, vantage point than when you're looking from the outside in. So trying to instill that into our journalists at all levels has been one uh, one real reaction to this and, uh, and one way to, to let people see that what we're giving our customers and, and their customers is, uh, is not, does not necessarily look like the, the raw sausage that, uh, that we cook up in the kitchen. Um, another way that we've done that is, and I'm, I'm hoping to emphasize this in Asia over the coming months and years, um, we, we want to ask the right questions at the beginning of a story that spin out into true multi-format journalism and journalism that's focused on a digital space. These may seem like very simple questions, but ask at the early part of the process, they can be a real, a real game changer. What is this story really about? How should this story be told? What are, our, what are our customers and users and readers looking for from this story? They're very basic questions and they may seem a bit of a truism, but, uh, but when you ask those at the outset of a story, and not just enterprise stories, but in breaking news situations, you can come up with plans and you can, you can calibrate and direct the, and, and conduct the symphony of, of all the journalism better if you're conducting it to a specific set of themes rather than reacting. And we're good as, as news organizations at reacting. We need to be. We need to swing into action immediately. But we don't want to be on autopilot from the beginning because autopilot leads us, leads separate formats down separate paths and it leads to a lot of fragmentation in our own organization that uh, that, that has us wandering off into the side and not being as effective as we could be. Thank you. Um, Alan, you're the Yahoo Southeast Asia's managing editor. And Yahoo is quite different, very different from mm. the traditional news organizations. So what's your take on all these issues? Yeah, so the interesting about Yahoo is that we've, you know, we're always known as the, the granddaddy of the consumer internet world. And we've been around for, I would say, about 15 years now. Um, we're not young, we're not all that old either, um, but we do have a lot of things that, that we're working on in terms of trying to understand exactly where, where things are going as far as online journalism goes. So right now, the, the big focus for us is around 
this whole shift toward mobile. We're calling that, you know, the big strategic platform shift of 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 this age. Um, and it's no longer about, you know, the medium being the message. It's now the distribution is the message, um, and that's exactly where we focus on. We want we want to make sure that we understand exactly what consumers are doing on their mobile devices, how they're consuming news, how they're sharing it, because that really frames the way we tell our stories. Um, and this is something that we're going to be spending a lot of time on going forward. We, are, we already do. Um, we're putting in more, resources in, in more resources into it because, you know, the way people use their phones is very different from the way they use their desktops. Um, so for us, that, that represents a massive revolution in the way that we think and the way we act as, as a team. Um, the stories that we use to cover on desktops, on PCs, are not the same stories as we would cover on, on mobile. Um, the way we would present those stories would be different as well. So a good example is the way we would crop stories. How would you crop a story for a mobile phone, right? The great newswire services like AP, AFP have, have long dealt with photos in the full size, believing that they were going to appear on the front page somewhere. But for the mobile audience, it's a whole different ballgame. How do you make sure that the photos appear the way they should? How do you make sure that the photos carry the same um, quality when it comes to color, or if it's black and white, how do you make sure you, you capture all of that within the same amount of space? So a lot of these things are becoming increasingly important for us um, as a company to understand how do we distribute better, how do we make sure that we're, we're providing the right content in front of people. We're also spending a lot of time on personalization, um, which I know is often a very loaded uh, word in a, in a context like this. Uh, but we really do feel that given the amount of information and news out there, there is you know, great importance that needs to be attached to the way people discover stories. How do you find stories that, that interest you? How do you make sure that the algorithms that, that deliver that to you are continuously improved on? So those are the two big revolutionary things that, that we're facing in the industry, um, you know, making sure that we're we're catering to, to a mobile audience in the way they're consuming it, and also making sure that we have the right personalization services uh, that help people discover what they're looking for. Now, uh, for all our panelists here, you are global media organizations, but you are located in Asia. Um, does the local audience mean anything to you? Of course it does. How? Um, and what are the challenges in... Uh, making it relevant locally and also globally? Um, well, I think for us, you know, we always have a sense that we have two audiences in the countries across Asia where we're working. So we have our global audience. The majority of our core readers are in the United States still. And although our audiences are growing faster in Asia than elsewhere, we always do have to bear those audiences in mind uh, that, are, that are looking overseas. So if you take our coverage uh, of one, in, I mean, it's difficult to talk about Asia as a whole. I think you have to think about it in different um, country by country. But if you look at our, our coverage in India, for instance, we have about 60 journalists in India, 95% um, of whom are Indian nationals. Um, we have a significant amount of terminal customers and internet um, consumers of our news uh, in India. We have a television channel partner in India. So there's a huge amount of our content that has to be very locally uh, targeted and directed. And a lot of that stuff would not be interesting for a global audience. Um, we've had a huge story out of India in the last few weeks, obviously, with the election and a big change of government, a seismic political shift happening. That's something that everyone in New York wants to read about. Okay, There's a huge, um, a huge amount of interest in that story. Um, before that, Indian politics, it's a little bit obscure for a lot of people outside the country. It's very complex. There's a lot of different personalities. The people in the in, inside India really do want to read that story. So you can explore that sort of subject matter in depth. You can interview some of the characters. You can explore the themes. You're not going to get people reading it so much in Europe or the United States. So we do have to wear two hats in all of the countries in Asia. And with, we are always thinking about the local customer. But if you're looking at the big pieces that we're going to invest a lot of time in, we always try and think, is this going to resonate globally? So you have to sort of weigh that up when you're judging what sort of coverage that you do. Um, increasingly, also, uh, local language is very important in Asia as well. Um, we uh, um, have a Japanese language service 
which is incredibly important for our, our presence in Japan. Um, we have a Chinese language service, which is vital, and we're going to be growing that, actually, um, over the next few years in quite a major way, um, hopefully, um, which is vital for our presence in China, in, in, in Taiwan uh, as well. Um, so yeah, uh, in Korea, we've just started in the last year a Korean language service. It's very sort of nascent at the moment, but that's going to grow as well. So local language is a big part of it as well. Yeah, I agree with uh, David, I think that a couple of tiers that we work on as a, an international news agency, we're always going to take a global perspective. That's what our clients expect of us. But we do consider ourselves to be uh, specialists in Asia as well. And so we have a sort of a two-tier system going on. We're, we're, right, we're right the global reps, but there's, an, there's, a, there's another layer of, uh, of, of stories aimed at Asian audiences. Uh, you know, uh, we find that our Asian clients and, and their readers are great consumers of news about the region, about the neighbors, you know. Um, whether it be political or economic or, you know, entertainment um, or, or even, you know, or quirk, quirky stories. Um, a Asia consumes a, l a lot of Asian news. We do that uh, also, like Bloomberg, in a num number of different languages. And so that goes down to a, you know, we cut, cut through to um, a, s a more local level again um, by tailoring stories um, and, and content to, to appeal to those audiences, whether it be, you know, Korean uh, speakers, Chinese speakers, Bahasa Indonesia speakers, uh, or Urdu, Urdu speakers. Um, we also uh, employ, we've got 250 to 300 journalists across, across Asia. We employ a lot of, of Asian staff who um, are deeply aware uh, of and, and knowledgeable about uh, culture and uh, political culture and economic culture in their own countries. So that brings a depth of understanding uh, that would not always appeal to uh, international audiences, but it's extremely important to understand the context, and uh, a, a lot of it will, will appeal specifically to regional audiences as well. I mean, we, <laughs> we same languages, um, many of them across Asia. I think the one thing that you shouldn't underestimate, though, is uh, if you segment your audiences too carefully, you can... you you will not be giving people in other parts of the world what they want. By which I mean, if we have China Real Time, our blog, in, in English and in Chinese, and then we have you know, CWSJ, and we have um, Asia.wsj.com, and we have USWSJ.com, what you don't think about though is there are people in the United States and people in every country in the world who will consume everything that you can give them on China, right? and who will consume everything you can give them on India. So maybe the print paper in the United States is going to make distinctions and say, well, we just need one story about uh, Indian elections or so, you know, or a series of stories. This is a hot time. We have to get a lot of it in print. But there are audiences out there who will take an endless, endless stream of content on specific topics. And the worst thing that we can do is try and go too high to the point where we get disintermediated by somebody who comes along and says, we will really tell you about China. And we will take you down to street level in China. And you can let the Wall Street Journal and all the other big global news organizations fly way up in the stratosphere, and, but they won't really tell you what's going on. And that terrifies me. Right? So what we really want to do is be able to give people views of China in one place that's a very deep vertical of content that has multiple different perspectives in it because that alone would be huge in the United States. Right? So it's not a case that it's only an audience in Asia that wants more granular cover of Asia, coverage of Asia. There's tons of Indians all over the world who I would far rather came to India Real Time or India.wsu.com than went to the HindustanTimes.com or timesofindia.com. I mean, it's a competitive business. I would rather take that traffic to us and have them say, actually, the Wall Street Journal, even though I live in Dubai or the United Kingdom, the Wall Street Journal gives us terrific perspective and content at a very, you know, maybe not right at street level, but from a thousand feet up. That's how I keep up with Indian news. And I think you'll see a lot more of that going forward. Thank you. Um, Chad of AP. So I, I, <clears throat> I very much agree that it's a continuum. Uh, it's not necessarily different tiers. And the trouble with a continuum when you're sort of trying to calibrate between covering Asia for Asia and covering Asia for elsewhere is that, there's, like with many things, there's a pull toward the middle. And 
you risk ending up doing journalism that is not appealing to the people who are far away and not appealing to the people who are right there. So we have a lot of conversations in the AP about how to, how to try to hit that sweet spot and how to, how to control this, this ladder so that uh, we are covering Asia for Asia in some very fundamental and, uh, and substantive ways, but that we can also cover it at a little bit more of an, an altitude when necessary. And I think that requires, from a, a staffing perspective, it requires a, a balance of outsiderism and insiderism, as I call it. I think that you need to have people who are doing the journalism in every country who have experience being within a culture and experience about that culture coming in from the outside. And sort of the, the, the catalytic energy that comes from having those people's brains bang up against each other in, in our, our bureaus, uh, that, that helps. And that helps keep us honest because we are, are always asking the question, who is this relevant to and, and, and how can we, what, what relevance, what, what audience are we aiming at for this? And we don't always get it right. Uh, I think that um, uh, we do want to try to determine when something is a breakout story, but I also think that we want to take steps to make things a breakout story sometimes, to, to say this is a moment, this is an inflection point, uh, let's, let's write this and film this and photograph this big. Uh, and that's, that's something that we talk about a lot as well, because I think that if we don't do that, we are going to miss the boat on a lot of stories that we're maybe a little bit in the weeds on, but that we need to see are big. And what I found also is that many of the 30,000 foot stories, if they're not written too much for an American audience or, or geared too much toward, uh, toward Americans, they work locally too, because people are looking for a little bit more perspective on that stuff. So often when you say this is going to be something that's a little bit more in the clouds, that ends up working for the Asia audience as well. Thank you. Ellen? Um, the Asian audience is obviously important for us because this is one of the fastest growing regions in the world when it comes to, to mobile consumption. So if you look at what's going on in India and Indonesia, for example, um, it's not just a mobile first audience anymore. This is the assumption that we had five years ago, right? We thought that anyone who was coming online for the first time was coming online um, through mobile phones, which is true, yes. But what we're also noticing now is that mobile is the only platform they're coming on, right? So what's different about the emerging markets in Indone uh, Indo Indonesia and India is that when people are going to get online, they're going to get online through the mobile phones only. They're not going to buy a desktop, right? Not many families have that privilege. So that becomes a huge um, shift for us in the way we're looking at it. And, and you know, to the point that I was making earlier, the importance of understanding what the, the, what the mobile audience needs and wants and how do you tell a story according to that. Um, so to answer your question around you know, our, our overall interest in Asia, Yes, the emerging markets are important because that's where the next 100 million users are coming from. That's where the next 100 million of, of internet users are coming from. Um, as far as Southeast Asia goes, we provide um, services in basically three languages, uh, English, Vietnamese, and Indonesian. Um, we're on the ground. We've got local teams in Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Philippines. Thank you. Um, I've Throw more, one more question at the panel here before I open up to the, the floor, so get your questions ready. Uh, we have many young, aspiring journals here. So when you hire, what kind of talents are you looking for? You tell us. Um, well, just going back to what I mentioned a bit earlier, I think um, you know flexibility these days and adaptability is a key thing that we're looking for. People who can switch gears, between different modes of telling a story um, are very appealing. Um, here in Asia, I mean, I think this group of people here, you know, you can just see the diversity. Um, the, 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 this organization is built around uh, people who are Asian and American. I think if you can have those people who can straddle um, different continents in their, um, in, uh, you know, their background and their language skills, all of these things are obviously very appealing, but ultimately, you know, I mean, it's it's um, what do you always look for in journalists? You know, people who can tell a good story, people who are, who are inquiring, who who work hard, probably got a tough skin. I mean, it's, these are the qualities that don't change. But it it is also that uh, that awareness of the complexity now of the industry um, and a willingness to engage in that um, and be part of this revolution that we've all been talking about. Thank you. I think that um, we want 
journalists who understand, A, how to dig and break news, that's very obvious, but B, who, who understand story as opposed to understanding platform. Uh, we have many people who, who come to us and they're talking about things purely in terms of their native platform. And I think that, I mean, that, that goes a long way, but if you can show that your approach to journalism is based on story and how to tell, how to tell a story and how to get the relevant information for that story, and then it spins out into format and platform, that's going to go a long way. Obviously, everybody's going to have a core competency. Everybody's going to have the place where they're most comfortable and where they can excel the most. But if you are someone who thinks about story, then by definition, you think about platform, you think about packaging and delivery. You're a participant in digital culture. You, uh, you, you understand how things move around in social media. And I think that if you go back to what are we trying to do, we're trying to show people the world in all its rich and varied ways. And someone who can see that and see beyond a platform that they're locked into is going to, they're going to punch through the static a little bit more. Yeah, Ted, Ted agree with Ted. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's storytelling remains. The, old, the good old-fashioned fundamentals of journalism uh, remain, remain what's really, really core, you know, being able to tell stories, being able to ask questions, uh, being able to uh, find ways around uh, blockages to, find, to, to finding information, but also being able to stand back and get a bit of perspective and put a bit of context in, in, into a story, not get, not, not, not get too, too lost in the weeds. Um, increasingly importantly, it's to be able to think across multiple platforms, even if you, even if you, you, you don't operate them as, as Ted said. I mean, uh, stories are approached in such different ways now. If you take an example of Nelson Mandela's funeral uh, late, late last year, I mean, the, the two stories that spring to mind immediately uh, when, when you think of that are, are, are two stories not directly related to Nelson, Nelson Mandela or the, or the funeral at all. It's one, one is the, sell, the Obama selfie, which went viral around the world, and the other one is the, uh, the, the signer who uh, um, couldn't sign at all. Um, and the, these, the, these things went absolutely viral. And a few years ago, these would have been perhaps not even sidebars, maybe small sidebars from for major, international, major international news agencies. Now they, those, those become the stories. Those are the top stories. And they're, they're both visually driven stories. Text journalists who uh, are not looking out for that and who don't, don't see uh, the visual potential and how that visual potential is going to drive an entire story based on the images um, are simply going to miss out. Uh, thanks. Um, I would say uh, just be creative. Just be creative and just be interesting about how you present, how you think about what you do and how you present yourself in doing that. And I mean, I think everybody here is probably a few years into um, their careers. So where you went to school, what grades you got are already totally irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. I would rather that somebody walked into the office and said, here's, the, here's what I was given in my old job, and here's what I did with that, or my current job, here's what I did with that, and it shows that I'm a very creative thinker. I probably have, ideally have a bit of life history that's a bit more interesting than you were just a straight A student. Right? Something that is just going to say, we are, I recognize that we are in a creative industry, right? We're not bankers and lawyers. With all due respect to bankers and lawyers, we're in journalism for a reason. And it's a far more creative industry than it was at any point in its history up until now. So you can get to be a bit film director, you can be a bit movie producer, you can be a bit artist, you can be a bit writer. You just have to come with ideas. The thing that kills me with especially with job applicants, is everything. It looks absolutely fantastic, right? A glistening resume of extraordinary academic achievement. And then you sit down opposite that person, and you just can't have a conversation. It would be the most boring person to sit next to at a dinner party that you could imagine. Don't be that person. <laughs> right? You're going to be talking to people all the time. And if you're coming in to talk to me, or you come in and talk to anybody in this panel, the first thing we're gonna use that for is a proxy for how you would do your job. And I really don't want someone out there representing the Wall Street Journal who, if I was gonna to talk to the same source, that source would say, oh, that seemed pretty smart, but God, really dull. And I don't wanna to talk to him again. It's a proxy, right? Your interview with us is a proxy for how you would do your job as a journalist. 
So you need to be able to bring all of those traits just to just so that you have ideas. And I mean, just look at us. Honestly, we're not. We're, we're, we. You can bring creative, exciting, interesting ideas to this equation far more than any of us will be able to tell you. Be creative in this way. Right? And just please embrace that and just be very, think way, way down the line about how you can present stories and kind of ideas that you can bring to the table. It just makes it far, far more appealing. And teach us something. So um, I'm going to try to be a little provocative here and shake things up a bit. Um, so I don't agree that, that the storytelling is the most important component of, of new media. Um, I actually believe that the platform is the message. And getting the platform right really frames the story that you're trying to tell. Um, and this is what we're looking for in, in terms of talent. We're looking for people who know how to use different social media channels, for example. When do you decide to use you know, a photo on Twitter versus a photo on Instagram? Understanding that is the critical part of, I think, the digital revolution and where journalism is headed. Um, I'm looking for people who know what are the up-and-coming new platforms, uh, people who have an eye on some of the changes that they want to see in the way apps work, for example, um, and workflows. How do you take a story and add more elements to it? How do you figure out, you know, do you want to use a, a tweet in this case? Do you want to use a photo instead? Do you want to use an embedded video? Um, so the people who who understand how to use these different types of technologies and platforms are the ones who, are, who end up telling a much better story down the line. And I think this is uh, you know, of utmost importance for, for anyone who's, who's looking to enter um, this new age of journalism, I'd say. Can I read the yes. <laughs> I actually don't think there's any point of disagreement here. Um, I think that storytelling has become, no, I, I think that storytelling has become understanding platforms. And I think that, that being able to operate in those platforms, that blows back to the beginning of the process. And if you don't have the beginning of a storytelling process in journalism that is thinking about the platforms that you're referring to, then you're not a competent storyteller in today's world. So, so I actually think that although it may, maybe it's provocative, but I don't think it's a point of disagreement because we've simply expanded the notion of storytelling to understand where it ends up and then loop that back into our storytelling decisions. I think, and you're also expanding the notion of journalism. I mean, because the industry is being disrupted. What, what makes the core of journalism? And it's also expanding. So maybe with that, we'll go to the floor. OK, some hands goes up first. <laughs> then, and then it's from there. Yes. Uh, uh, identify oh. yourself briefly. I'm Tiffany App from the South China Morning Post. I'm just wondering how, how well you think um, heavy uh, multimedia immersive packages like Snowfall are really resonating with your audiences, especially in light of the, n the leaked New York Times innovation report. I think, um, you know, I've been enjoying um, some of the work the uh, Wall Street Journal's been doing, the Kellen Wild City. My own organization did something on Tiananmen. We poured, I think, we had 12 people working on it. But at the end of the day, do you think that readers are consuming it? Because I think there's a tendency to tweet about it, look at it, and then after three minutes, bounce from it. Um, so people are sharing it, but are they are they reading it? And you know, it was three years ago since Snowfall came out, it won a Pulitzer. I think a lot of people thought it was the the future of journalism, but is it? Uh, I think it is as a one of the ways to tell stories. So the Colin Wald City piece that you were nice enough to reference that was a big interactive plus a 17 minute video, which is very very long for us and between translating it into Japanese, Chinese, obviously it was in English, uh, Yahoo. Yahoo was nice enough to pick it up. So we ended up with about 3.4 million views, right? That's very good for us, especially for something that's not a core topic for the Wall Street Journal. So yes, I think they are, if you present it in uh, eye-grabbing ways and think very hard about how you're gonna keep the audience. Um, the thing I would like to do in terms of what you don't want really is to trap yourself into these all have to be built from the ground up every time. 
right? And these are somehow totally special, and they're all off in a little lab somewhere that produces them, and they build them from scratch. What you really want, and what we've been trying hard to do, is come up with templates that you can use over and over again with minimal adaptation. So if you look at it from a US end, we had two at the end of last year. Uh, one was on drug trials, another was on lobotomies that had been performed on World War II veterans. Both of those took us very approximately six months to build each, right? We can now put together one of those immersives in, about, in less than a week, right? And, with, and that is what you want to get into it for stories that merit that kind of treatment. You want to be able to produce them over and over and over again and build them into the flow of everything that you offer. So when, when they're good, they absolutely resonate. And what I would really like to do in addition to making them very regular is make them about core topics that people recognize as the franchise of the Wall Street Journal. And uh, yes, because I know on Kowloon Wall City, for instance, all the little videos that were on the side were the most popular videos on globalwsj.com, all five of them for about two weeks. So yeah, I think they are. I mean, not everybody, but not everybody reads the, I'm afraid to have to tell you this, but not everybody reads to the end of your story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, how engaged they are, yeah, the important thing is, like, you know, do, yes, are many, many people getting a lot from it? Yeah, so that's plenty. Others want to jump in? We, um, I think the answer to your question, like so many things, is a fragmented answer. Uh, we, um, we had a, a long-form story not long ago um, in which there emerged a great debate in the comments section that got kind of nasty about the, the closing quote, the kicker quote. And I thought that that was a very, uh, to, to the point about are they reading it, I thought that was a, a very interesting signpost for us. Um, this, is, this is about platform again, about understanding at the beginning of the storytelling process what you're going for. And from the smallest atomized piece of content to the largest, most elaborate interactive presentation, you want to be thinking about what that audience is and where that audience is going to be and also when that audience is going to be, which is important for the AP. Um, we've gotten some feedback from customers that, uh, there are certain sweet spots, periods of time, where the uh, longer stories, uh, I'm referring to tech stories, of course, are, uh, are more popular with their customers and that, that it's a better time for that kind of thing. The introduction of tablets, iPads, with the lean back device versus the lean forward device and the, uh, the peak hours of usage in different places has given us more information about how to position this stuff. So I don't think that that is what you're talking about is the future, and I'm a huge fan of long form. I used to write long form. I, I am something of an, an advocate for it within my organization, but I also recognize that like anything else, it's one tool in your toolbox, and if you're using the, the hammer when you need the screwdriver, then you're not going to succeed. Yeah, I, mean, I, would, I would agree with that. I think um, you know, to directly answer your question, is, was Snowfall the future journalism? Well, no, no, it's not. I mean, it's, 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 it's something that you can use. It's in the, it's in the toolbox, is it, as, as we said. I mean, I think that um, for a huge amount of our work that we do, we're trying to scale back the length of things, actually. I mean, I think, you know, we can tell who reads to the end of our stories on, on the turn. It's a pretty frightening statistic, actually, if you look at it, like um, who's paging forward on stuff. So, you know, a lot of people are only reading the top. People don't have time to trawl through this stuff. Yes, but there, there are going to be benchmark moments in some of these topics where you can really put the bellows to it and you can give it this treatment. But can you do it to most things? No, absolutely not. I think people want to consume things in, in snappier formats, different formats, as I said earlier, you know, at different times of the day, in different moods and different modes. So we've got to uh, um, accommodate all of those different things. And yeah, it's wonderful to be able to have these standout pieces. You know, I think the kind of thing was, was fabulous as well. Uh, but you know, they are, they are you know, they're, they're rare events, I think, you know, not the norm at all, and certainly not the future generally of journalism as an industry. I think you know the the fact is you're not going to get a straight answer to that question just because everyone is experimenting right now and we should we should try different things and see what we what we learn from them and, and what kind of users we bring in you know a project like this for example will bring in a very different audience that you normally would have because it would have been shared wider than than your core audience would have read um, so you do bring in a new audience you bring in uh, people who've got different interests and you'll never quite figure that one out until you get the right metrics in place. So, you know, that goes to my other point. Um, you know, the, one of the nicest things about the internet is that you can measure everything, but that's also the problem. Because once you start measuring things, you start asking yourself, so what's the value of this? What's the importance of someone scrolling past, you know, the second and third signpost? Um, what, what is the value of someone sharing it? 
So inherently, it comes back down to what you as an organization feel are your important success metrics. What makes a difference for you and your organization? What, what thrills and delights your audience? And learn, and learn how to measure that properly. So what it means is that uh, don't get discouraged and actually tell your boss not to be discouraged by the, um, the, the package you just produced. The tenement package takes a lot of resources. Maybe you worry about the hits, but um, it's one, you're experimenting. It's great that the Morning Post is experimenting. So maybe Raimi can bring that up too. Uh, on the voices of um, tenement. Yeah, actually the GMSC would participate. It would supply, you know. Interviews, uh, videos. That was a beauti beautifully done Thank presentation. You. So tell your bosses, right? I think that's important. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll look at that. There are steps, but I think uh, it will have it will also have staying power. It will also go into schools. I think it was a great primer for understanding what happened. Yeah. Um, yes, I think uh, he has his hand up. Please keep your question short, direct. Okay. I'm Glenn Van Zutphen from Van Media Group. Um, with great deference to your decades of experience and your expertise, it's hard not to notice that four out of the five of you uh, are not Asian. What is your succession plan, and how many more years before this conference has four out of the five of you being Asian men or women? Yeah, I mean, as, I, as the yeah, gatekeepers. It's, 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 it's frankly embarrassing to look at. <laughs> You know, this lineup here, and I think it's something, you know, that I think we think a, a lot about in our organization. Um, uh, trying to find the talent is why we're engaging, you know, with this association as well, to try and find these people who can um, lead our news organization um, uh, and all the bureaus across Asia who are a much more diverse group. You know, and I'd much rather we all looked a lot more like everyone who's who's looking at us now than, you know, than we do. So, you know, uh, how many years is that going to take? I mean, it, 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 across Asia, if you look at our bureaus, I mean, we, we do this quite scientifically, actually. We're looking at the diversity of our leadership and we're looking at succession planning. Um, we're, we're doing pretty well on a bureau chief level. It's just when you get on slightly more senior managing editor, executive editor level, not so good. But I would say hopefully in, you know, within the next five years, then maybe we could have somebody a little bit more interesting than me sitting here. Any other comments? I think that's right. I think it's uh, uh, it, it is embarrassing, but it is, but it, but it is changing. It might not be changing quite uh, quite as fast as uh, as all of us would like. But uh, um, in our organisation, we are putting putting efforts into uh, active e efforts into diversifying newsrooms um, and, and 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 headquarters. Um, it's a it's a, it's about the talent. It's about finding the talent. It's about it's about breeding and nurturing the talent, and um, um, it'll 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 come right. We'll I, I also think it makes for, for better journalism, quite frankly. I hope it doesn't happen with the AP too quickly because I just started this job two weeks ago. But um, <laughs> in, I think that, that we, we want to do this because it's the right thing to do, but we also want to do this because it's the journalistically right thing to do, frankly. I mean, you don't have the same kind of vantage point and the same kind of decision making. And I, I like to think of myself, I've spent a lot of time in, in Asia, many years in Asia, but I'm not you know, uh, I, I don't have that insider perspective. I don't have that, um, the, I guess, the Asian equivalent of digital native, you know. I, I, I feel like that needs to be a fundamental part of news gathering in any Asian endeavor, because if it is not, then you don't have, you, you lack perspective and you, your, your bandwidth of journalism is narrower and you don't, you don't know as much and you don't help your readers and viewers and users know as much. So yes, I think it's a, a point very well taken. Thank you. Um, actually, that's the, the point about why the GMSC is here. Because if you see the, uh, can you turn around so people can see the words at your back? Is that right? We're trying to promote Asian voices, global views with the global views, uh, training the real, the new gen next generation of journalists and leaders. Okay, so uh, could I could I just make one more point about this as well? And if you look at actually the, the the coverage, the news stories, another thing we do very badly is using diverse voices. In the news, if you take a random selection of the front page stories and you look at who the lead quote is, you know, 90% of the time, it's going to be a man. And um, I think we really need to get our reporters to proactively go out and seek diverse voices to inform our stories um, and give people more of a platform. And I think that'll, that'll uh, make for better journalism as well. And frankly, you're more likely to do that if you are 
not one of us four. <laughs> okay. Actually, we have five more minutes, I was told. So let's have the lady at the back quickly. Show us a question. Maybe a collect. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Um, my name is Nadia Daly. I'm with um, CNN here in Hong Kong. Um, as you guys are all talking about, our industry is seeing a very uh, significant migration of um, audiences from traditional media to newer media, online media. Um, and even though traditional uh, online media is seeing a lot of extra, you know, people um, are looking at traditional media sources on online platforms, um, what's quite difficult for um, many traditional news outlets is to make money from this. So um, I'm quite interested to hear um, how you think, um, what you think the best um, funding sort of funding model is to, to monetize um, digital media. That's a I think there's another panel to deal with it. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, you raised an excellent point. I mean, the way we refer to it internally, I don't think this is our original phrase, but the way that basically we've gone from getting dollars in print to dimes online. Right? And the and we know what the metrics are. It's difficult to find. I think it's going to be hopefully the end of the collective madness that took hold of everybody in the early 1990s when we decided that something that had co cost us a lot of money to produce and that people had been willing to play, pay for in print for over a century suddenly should just be given away for free. Right? I mean, it's, it does cost a huge amount of money to put together good journalism. And we need to be very compelling and much better at convincing people that it's worth paying for. So from our perspective, I think a lot of the drive will be around subscription. Frankly, advertising revenue is always going to be tough. It would be nice to have, but the print revenue, you know where, which way that's headed in advertising. The digital revenue, it's going to be a long time before that comes up on the advertising side to come anywhere near it. So there'll be a big emphasis on subscriptions. And then that's around, so what are you offering people for subscription? What are the value? In fact, are you really subscribing? Are you inviting them to join? Are we going to have members rather than subscribers? And if you're going to have members, then what are you getting in addition to at the moment, you know, hey, you get to read the rest of the story, right? We got to be able to say this is genuinely valuable to you. There are people like you who are also here. What other opportunities can we create in terms of a community? What are the extra privileges that membership of the Wall Street Journal can bring? And I think that is uh, where, certainly from our perspective, we would be putting our chips going forward. Uh, yeah, I, th I mean, I think I think it depends on the organisation. I don't think you know there, there's a, there's one model that is best for the industry as a whole. I think it depends on the audiences that you're serving. Um, you know, the FT has a very successful subscription model because they can charge you know you can charge money for premium financial news because it's it's got a, a more of a, a financial value to it for for the readers. I think the Wall Street Journal is is operating a very successful subscription model. We have a very um, successful subscription model with our Bloomberg terminals which are very expensive, you know, $20,000 a year. People pay for them. It's not just for the news. It's for all sorts of things. But that gives us a big luxury because that funds the news organization. Currently, we have a free model for the websites. Um, there is a, a bit of a transformation going on in the next 18 months with our, our digital presence. Our websites are going to be redesigned. We're actually going to be launching some new uh, digital properties over the next uh, 18 months, including localized websites across um, Asia. And the, 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 initially, these, these are going to be free. Um, as I say, we have the, the luxury of being fund, very well funded from the terminal side of the business, so uh, we don't have to do a subscription at the moment. Will we down the line? We might consider it, but right now we're, we're, we're in the process of uh, redesigning those sites, trying to broaden the audience. Um, we're going to be um, changing some of the content that we produce on the Bloomberg News side to fund those, to, uh, to, to fill those websites, and then maybe we'll look at what the audience is and whether, whether it could tolerate some sort of uh, payable down the line, but currently we're going to do a free model. But as I said, you know that's that's appropriate for us now at this point in time. I think every news organisation is serving a different sort of customer, producing different sorts of content. Have to think in their own ways what is appropriate. I guess I, I, I won't answer the question directly, but I will throw one additional thing in, which is I think that understanding audience and unlocking unlocking the secrets of audience is a key to building that model. Um, and in the AP's case, understanding the customers that we serve, that serve that audience. Because I don't think you're going to be able to have any business plan that has any real chance of success without deeper metrics and deeper understanding of that audience. OK. 
Okay. Can we take one more? One more question? Okay. I saw this hand. Hello, my name is Chae Jo from Seoul, South Korea. Um, I'd like to hear about the specifics about how all four news organizations treating the SNS, like how to verify the SNS coming from the Facebook or the Twitter. Because I come from South Africa, I don't know much about the news organization from around the world, how to treat the SNS like Twitter or Facebook. And also how Yahoo treating this kind of SNS stories to upload the, the pages through the Yahoo. So I want to know the specifics. Thank you. Sure. Um, so let, let me get this right. So the question is around how we validate, verify user-generated content. Yeah. So, you know, the standard rules apply. I mean, I don't think that that user-generated content is is that different from basic journalism, which is to say that you fact-check the same way you do, you corroborate as you do. Um, but the one, one of the nice things about about working in the online digital space is that every bit of content now comes with a little bit of metadata connected to it. So it makes it easier for you to, to geotag a photo, for example. It makes, you, it makes it easier for you to, to dig down into the metadata and see whether you can find any truth to that. Um, and also, people are on the internet, or at least in, in the social space, in a much bigger way than they've ever been. So it's easier for you to validate whether this person is a person of authority, whether this person has any history to, you know, to, to this particular issue. Um, it helps you build very quickly an understanding of the domain expertise of that person, if, if that's the case. But you know, to, you know, the, the, the quick answer to, to your question is, you know, um, none of these things have changed. You know, we, we now have more tools, in fact, that allow us to corroborate and, um, and fact check that we've never had before. It goes back to basic journalism, check your, check your sources, and uh, you do it in a different way with electronic media, uh, a, a combination of the metadata that's available, um, asking the right questions, contacting the person, um, in the same way that you would um, in interview a person until you're satisfied that the information contained in it corro is cor corroborated by the other vectors. One of the most uh, famous photos the AP ever ran in 1995 after the uh, Oklahoma City bombing was a picture of a, uh, a firefighter holding a young girl who later died. That was taken by a bank clerk. Um, that was user-generated content a year into the internet. And we went through the same verification process with that as we do today. The AP has... Uh, set up a, a unit specifically for, for looking into and verifying or debunking user-generated content. And uh, for every piece of user-generated content we've put out on any of our services, there are many, many, many that we've discarded. So I think that that, that fundamental thing can't change. Um, that is journalism at its most basic, and whatever your, your platform of information coming at you, that, uh, that, that, that is a, a, a core value that is just applied to this this new stream of information coming in. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously if, if something's out on Twitter, I mean, it's already published, right? I mean, it's there for the world to see. So at what point do you take that in and give it the, the validation of, of, of republishing it yourself or doing the story? Absolutely, you run the checks uh, that you would do on any sort of source material. We now have a team of people dedicated to watching social media for breaking news around the world, whether it's Twitter or, or Weibo in China, you know, and they're scanning everything that's going on there, um, obviously curating from trusted sources, but you know, I mean, famously, of course, you know, the um, uh, Bin Laden, you know, news of his uh, of his uh, uh, his death was 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 first on Twitter, you know. So you've got to be very alert to this stuff. But everything has to go through exactly the same checks and balances that you would go through with any piece of source material. Okay, thank you. Um, well, this is a great panel. The revolution is going on in the newsrooms, but fundamentals don't change. Uh, be flexible, be creative, and don't be boring. <laughs> yeah. Let's give our panel a hand. Thank you. All right. So we're going to take a brief 10-minute uh, break. I'm going to ask the panelists to head to the banners. We're going to take a photo with you guys. And then we're going to uh, set up for our next panel, which is at Tiananmen Square 25 years later with uh, Chrissy Lou Stout and uh, Tankman photographer Jeff Widener. Thank you.